I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I always, I always read emails before I start, before I teach. We get emails from all over the world. We get them from uh, Japan and China and Australia. And we get them from England and from Holland and all over South America and all over all over uh, uh, Africa. And these are people that write because I teach from the Greek text. And uh, Manny in North Carolina writes, and he says, Greetings. You read an email today uh, from a brother in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm requesting either his contact information or if you would have him contact me. I, I'll have Tom do that. I can't. We'll have Tom take care of that. I want to meet him. I live in the area, and I have most of my jobs here in Charlotte. My contact information is below, and he gives that. I am married with five homeschool children. I own my own business, and the telephone number above is my business cell phone. I keep my voice mailbox full so new customers can't leave messages. <laughs> I don't know why that is. So if he would test me, I will reply. Text me, I will reply to him back. My intentions are to meet and have fellowship in the Lord. It's lonely out here. I have people say that in California, New York, and Texas, and Oklahoma. They say it's lonely. It's going to be lonely when few are finding the narrow way. My wife and children have been out of fellowship with anyone for six years because I cannot sit through Baptist mixed messages. I can't either. And it confused my family. For your information, even before being blessed by the Sovereign Lord, leading me to Bible teacher Jim Brown, I stopped Chris Christ's Mass 21 years ago. Good for you. It, along with the Lord, forcing me out of my business I was in because it was vanity of vanities is what caused my then-wife to divorce me. I chose that wife. The Lord chose my current wife. None of me and my wife's five children have done Christ Mass, nor will we. Blessed be the Lord for raising you up, Brother Jim. Every message you teach is yea and yea. God has blessed me and my wife and children with the wisdom he has given you. We listen most every day to one or more of your YouTube videos. Your messages confirm what's already in the elect. That's true. All I'm doing is confirming it. They just needed to hear it spoken and it's locked in. That's true. You had it written in your heart by God, not by me. And uh, that's Manny in North Carolina. We love you, Manny. Keep writing to us. Uh, Tom didn't give me many. We usually get, he says, hundreds of these emails, but only got a few. Uh, Kathy in California, thank you very much for your reply. One more follow-up question to Pastor Brown is, should I keep attending that church? I'm attempting to witness to family members who know nothing of the word. The Bible said to withdraw from those people that walk disorderly. And they were to have nothing to do with people that listen to another doctrine. If we bid them God's speed, which is the word caro, C-H-A-I-R-O, you're partaker of their evil deeds, C-H-A-I-R-O. That is the word God's speed. It comes from the word charis which is the word grace. Grace. And the Bible says unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, Philippians 1.29, unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe upon him, but also to suffer for his sake. That word given 
comes from this same word, charizoma, C-H-A-R-I-Z-O-M-A-I. And that means, to, this is the word given, Philippians 1.29, to grant as, as a favor. God has favored you to allow you to suffer for his sake. So you can't go in there agreeing with them people. If you're listening to a preacher preach false doctrine, you're not supposed to be there. If you know a church to go to, there's probably not any around you. You can join us on Wednesday night at 630 Central Standard Time and or at uh, Sunday afternoon uh, at one o'clock and you can be a part of our ministry I don't know of any preacher that preaches what I believe is 100% of the truth nowhere I listen to them on radio I've listened to all of the big ones I can't stand to listen to them the reason the young people don't want to go to to church is because the preachers are boring that's why they don't say nothing worth nothing And most of the things they teach are false doctrine, and you don't need to be putting that in your eyes and your ears. And he goes on to say, uh, I'm sharing Pastor Brown's videos, but when it comes to going to church, there is no way I can suggest that, me either. The whole nation is corrupt. The churches everywhere are corrupt. All the Baptists, the Baptists were the last strongholds of Christianity, and they gave way. They quit preaching predestination, the sovereignty of God, back in the 1920s. That's when the Southern Baptists fell away, and the Independent Baptists broke off from them. And there were certain few that preached the sovereignty of God and organized a couple of seminaries, and then they quit. And they don't do it anymore. The Independent Baptists are just, you guys are just like a bunch of Southern Baptists. You don't believe nothing. Uh There is no way I can suggest that, considering the limited knowledge of so many pastors that they don't know what anything means. Some of them are like that big pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas. I can't think of his name. Uh, Jeffers. And he's supposed to he's supposed to believe in predestination, but he's a big guest speaker on Daystar and on TBN, and they talk to him, and everybody smooth talks each other. I don't believe in Jeffers at all. He says he believes predestination, but he don't. I actually took a quick look at real estate in Hendersonville, thinking I'll just move there and attend your church. Kathy in California wants to move here. But that's not a viable possibility. I'm happy studying at home and listening to Pastor Jim, but aren't we supposed to go to church also? No. (laughs) When the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but it doesn't mean go listen to a false teacher and do not bid him God's speed. These have to blend with all those verses of have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, rebuke those people. If you want to go into those churches and rebuke them, you're going to have a hard time. That's just the way it works. What does Pastor Jim suggest in that regard? The world, the whole American church is Roman Catholic. They've gone that direction. There's not a preacher that I believe in in America that I would go to his church if I wasn't preaching. If I lose my voice, I'll just watch my own. Michael keep playing my DVDs on all these uh, avenues, and I'll just watch them. People say, why do you watch your own messages? I watch them all the time because I learn from them. I say, did I say that? I don't remember saying that. i got to write that down and study something associated with that. I mean, I put out enough information that it's interesting. When I give somebody a DVD, I say, I'm not a boring preacher. These preachers are boring out of here. They're not saying nothing. Just love God and He loves you and everyone will go to you. We'll all tiptoe through the tulips and get to heaven someday. 
just, it's just a mushy, gushy gospel. Thank you for your replies and information. I'll do my best to share with the pastor of the church I mentioned. He ain't gonna like me. I mean, ain't, A-I-N-T. But I doubt he'll recant his beliefs in front of his followers. I don't even know the guy, but I am absolutely sure he's not going to do that. Should I keep going and sit there with the knowledge of wrong teaching? No, 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 never. You do that, he's going to pollute you and corrupt you. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 26, Be angry and sin not. Be angry is over the winds of doctrine that's being preached, that's causing the church to be past feeling. The word past feeling, apalga, O-A-P-A-L-G-E-O, means apathetic. This, the Bible says that these preachers are making the world apathetic. That means, I don't care. It comes from the word pathos. Pathos means to suffer. A, patho a doctor of pathological doctor is a doctor of suffering diseases. Apathos is the word apathetic. It means no suffering. You just don't care. That's what the winds of doctrine do to people. They think if he talks about a Jesus of some sort, we'll all go to heaven at the same time. He goes on to say, should I keep going and sit there with the knowledge of wrong teaching? That's kind of like asking me, should I go to take an algebra class and the teacher knows nothing about algebra and don't even know what an axiom is? No. <laughs> That's crazy. That I now know, although limited, thanks to the thoroughness of Pastor Brown. In a conundrum, and that's a puzzling situation, sincerely, Kathy, in California. Well, Kathy, we love you. You can come here if you want to. I have people ask me all the time, calling me from all over the America, what am I going to do? I'm out here in Oklahoma and nobody's talking about truth. I'm in Texas, nobody's talking the truth. I'm in California, I don't hear any preachers saying any truth, not like what you're saying. I don't know a preacher in this nation that is teaching truth to the degree, the definitions, the culture, the customs anymore. I, I'm not saying that in a boast. I'm saying that it depresses me. It proves we have to be close to the end of all things. We love you. Just keep writing, Kathy. I wish I could tell you something. Just watch us on the Internet and go out and tell everybody if you need DVDs or you need tracks, we'll send them to you. They're free. Everything we got is free. We give the gospel without charge. And then Connie in Lebanon, dear, dear sister, she's been with us 22, 24 years. She's got something called ataxia. She's got a disease called A-T-A-X-I-A. Taxia or taxis is a Greek word. T-A-X-I-S. That's the word. When Paul says as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, it's, it's actually the word tasso, which is a form of taxis. It means an orderly arrangement. Orderly arrangement. And the alpha primitive negates the word. It means no arrangement of the muscles in the body. She's losing her... It seems like everything somebody talks to me about has come from a Greek word. And it means she, her muscles have no organization. She can't swallow correctly. And she's getting to where she can't swallow. Her mother died of this, and it can strangle her one day. Let me tell you, I've been strangling in my life when I had real severe bronchial asthma, and there's nothing as terrifying as strangling. Nothing. I've had a heart attack. I've had a heart surgery. 
It's not when you're fighting for breath <laughs> and fighting to get air into your bronchial tubes down your air passages. It's terrifying. I've been woke up in the middle of the night running up and down the hallway years ago. I don't have that trouble now. <clears throat> I said, Mike, get up, take me, give me the doctor, give me the doctor right now, fast. And he'd be, I'd be fighting for breath, and some nights I'd tell Mary to get up and take me to the hospital. Got to the hospital one night, and one, one goofy nurse said, Now calm down, Mr. Brown. I said, You calm down. You, you can breathe. I can't breathe. And I just was hollering at her. God, you don't tell a guy to calm down when he can't breathe. That's just stupid. That was a stupid nurse. Didn't have any others do that to me. <clears throat> Connie says, uh, Jim, just wanted to tell you, I'm so glad you speak so plainly. I don't have any problem doing that. As to be easily understood, I also wanted to say as a sheep in the flock of Christ, I'm so glad you're not a hireling allowing the wolf to come in to destroy us. I love you, Jim, for teaching us how to truly love one another in God. Agape and phileo. Connie and Lebanon. We love you, Connie. I know you're going through some really hard times. I got some YouTube comments, and this first guy, boy, he is insulting. <laughs> they, they don't know when they write me this stuff. They're describing some guy that's not me. But they don't know that. He probably, he sounds like he's about 17 and 18 years old. Maybe he might be 22 or 23. <clears throat> his name, his handle is Lee B. Commented on predestination is always saved from the beginning to the end. This is a dis this is disgusting to watch. Well then, <laughs> turn your TV off. <laughs> a disgrace to the name of Christ. You sound like an independent Baptist to me. Not a trace of Holy Spirit. You mean truth? Holy Spirit's truth. John 14, 15, 16, John 15, 26, John 16, 13, 1 John 5 and 6. The Spirit is the truth. You mean we didn't have any truth? And truth is the word alethes, A L E T H E or L A T H E I A. That's the word truth. Did you know this? Well, let me explain it to you, okay? <laughs> it comes from Lanthano. Lanthano means to hide or conceal or to lie hid. And the alpha privative, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, has a negative particle and negates the word. And it means not to hide anything. Oh, I just told the truth there when I gave you the definition of truth. You don't, evidently, you don't know. Holy is the word hagios, means pure or singular. And the only thing that will make you hagios is the fire and the trial to burn out self. You didn't know that, did you? Jesus warned against such men in Matthew 7. What men like me that define the truth, define the words? He said, a good tree cannot bring forth bad fruit. And every tree that doth not bring good fruit, do you know what the fruit of the Spirit is? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faith. Against us there is no law. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I can define each one of those words, but I don't have time to do that. You need to buy you a concordance and a King James Bible. The truth is not in the King James Bible. It's in the Textus Receptus where the King James comes from. And thrown in the fire, this man rages with pride. Are you talking about <laughs> Alanzania or Huperefanos or Tufao? Those are all the words pride. Tufao means to be slowly consumed by smoke with no fire, to be, to be proud and lifted up, to be... And then the other word, hupere phanos, means to shine above others. Let me tell you, I'm not doing much shining. Most of the world hates me. Do they hate you? Jesus said, if the world hates me, it'll hate you. If you're popular in the world, you're an enemy of God. Are you popular? 
Woe in you when all men speak well of you. Do they speak well of you? You have to be hated. You have to be infamous. The Bible says, Blessed are ye when men shall reproach you. Reproach is the word O-N-E-I-D-I-Z-O. Onizo means to be infamous. That's when you're blessed. When you say, most people don't like me, you're in good shape. You're in good shape if you're telling them truth. Eli just told me that before. He said, no, a lot of people don't like me. Well, guess what? They don't like us either, do they? Not at all. And when we've got a full crowd here, which is not a lot of people, they don't like us. Bitterness, he says, this man rages with pride, bitterness, anger, and carnality. Well, do you know what carnality is? <laughs> Carnal is the word sarkikos, S-A-R-K-I-K-O-S, and it's a form of S-A-R-X. That's the word flesh, fleshly. I got over a lot of my flesh years ago. I don't want a new car. I don't want a new house. I don't want a lot of money. I want to tell the truth regardless of what it costs. Do you? He's like a monster. <laughs> Am I a monster? <laughs> Does not the Bible tell us that Christ's people are to be filled with the Spirit? You mean filled with the truth? Then what's in the heart will come out of the mouth. That's what the Bible says. You don't believe in predestination. You hate it? Then you're an enemy of God. To become humble, joyful, pure. I can define all those humble. Te panua. Means to level oneself to God, not to man. Joyful, kara. Pure. It's just a form of hagios, hagnos. Loving, it depends on which word love, agape, or phileo. Make pros. You put all these words down, you don't even know what they mean, do you? Full of peace. Irene means to bring together into one. Deferential. Whew. Different. Charitable. Charitable. Agape, that means to walk in God's commandments. That means to tell the truth all the time. Walking in the joy of the Lord. Joy is the word kara. Giving thanks. Eucharistia. I know you didn't know that. And praising, this man surely is going in the opposite direction. No, you've gone in the opposite direction. You don't care what anything means. And I sternly warn Christians against them. Oh, me. I found out that if a person's elect, they're going to embrace the truth. You evidently are not elect. If you are, God's going to have to beat you half to death to get your attention. Almost everything I've seen him teach is either incorrect or dangerous. You haven't watched very much, have you? We're on, we've got about 2,000 of our messages on the Internet. You're kind of an ignorant man. When Paul described the carnal man enslaved to the sin under the law, he wasn't describing a Christian. Yes, he was. He's describing himself. He said, how to perform that which is good, I don't find in me. People write to me and say the most idiotic things. He immediately contrasts this wretched state with freedom from sin in Christ telling us to be carnally minded is death. That's right. That's what you are. And they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're going after the things of this world, you cannot please God. Are you looking for money and things and stuff and cars and houses and women? Is that what you're looking for? Paul then tells Christians, be ye not in the flesh but in the spirit. He's talking about living in truth, crucifying the flesh. That is if the spirit of God dwells in you, Romans 8 and 9. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments Keep is the word terrell. It means to guard them against the loss that are written in our hearts. And his commandments are not grievous. He put burdensome. That is the same thing. 
For whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. Overcome is the word. Nikao is the verb, for, verb form of victory. Nike. And faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And faith is death to self. You mean all these things I've said to you in this answer are false doctrine? Is that what you're trying to say? But he who does not overcome risk his name being blotted out of the book of life. Jesus said, I will never blot your name out of the book of life. You know nothing about the book of life. As Jesus warned Revelation 3 and 5. This guy, he's an idiot, an idiot, unlearned, completely unlearned. If he can't learn, then he is stupid by our all right, whoever you are, Lee B., you're an idiot, or you're ignoramus. Jesus the Messiah writes and says, comments on Old Testament shadow, New Testament very image. I'm trying really hard to learn and obey. I'm trying to understand your teachings because I believe you're teaching truth. Thank you. How does a person crucify self? Well, a lot of people call me and ask me that. You have to learn some Bible. You, have, you don't crucify yourself by selling somebody, crucify me. You tell them the truth. You tell them Christmas is pagan. It was against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago in America. If you give them that much, they'll crucify you for that. If you, if you tell them predestination is true and God does not love everybody and you have to have a daily cross in order to go to heaven. That's what Jesus said in Luke 14 and 27, 26 and 27. You cannot go to heaven without a daily cross. People have to hate you. I heard you teach. Go out in the world and tell people the truth. The truth is taking the cover off. That's what it is. Tell them the definition. I'm still very confused. Watch more of my DVDs. Just tell them what I've said. Tell them Christmas is pagan, Easter's pagan, God doesn't love everybody, and predestination is true, and that'll get you enough to get crucified. Crucifies means to put you to death. Death does not mean annihilation, annihilating the body. Death is the word Thanos, T-H, A-N-A-T-O-S, or Thanatos. It means separation. It does not mean annihilation. When they want to separate from you, bless you to ye when men shall separate you because of the truth you tell. That's a daily cross. He doesn't mean go out there and make somebody mad if they throw you on the ground and they put nails in your hands. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about putting you to death spiritually. Now, where was I? I'm still confused about exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Tell the truth to your family. Tell it to your brothers and sisters. Tell them Christmas is pagan and you're not going to do it anymore. You don't have to get mean or cutting or abrasive. Just tell them it's paganism. It was against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago in America. And you'll get crucified for that. You will know how? That's how. Tell them God doesn't love everybody. <clears throat> Paraphrase the verse. Just say, God loved Jacob and hated Esau before either one were born, before either one had done any good or evil. What do you think about that, brother? He may not love you. If he loves you, he'll scourge you so you can partake of his holiness. Give him Bible. That's how you crucify self. I've listened to many, many of your teachings. You must have missed some of this. And done studying on my own. I want to be obedient more than anything. Then go out there and tell people truth. Memorize about five or six of these Greek words. Once you've got them memorized, use them. But let me tell you something. Nobody you talk to is going to know what you're talking about because they don't know nothing about the Greek. Give them a Greek word and then give them a definition. Say so that's what it means, whether you like it or not. That's how you crucify self. And it's real hard for a new, young, baby believer to do that. Take some years of learning some Greek words and paraphrasing some Bible verses. And if they want to ignore it and deny it, just leave them alone. And then Dirty B123 commented on 
well, Jesus the Messiah, you keep writing to us. Dirty B commented on God creates evil. Christmas under an ancient name is the reason God created evil. So you don't think Ron Wyatt found Jesus' blood? No. Even if he did, Jesus' literal blood is not the blood he covers our hearts with. That's, that, is, that is idiomatic terminology. He's washed us from our sins in his own, not literal blood. Ron Wyatt says he crawled up under <clears throat> Golgotha. Ron Wright was an archaeologist that uh, claimed a lot of things that I absolutely do not believe he did. Ron Wyatt went around. He was a semi-famous archaeologist. Went around holding these meetings, and he would invite Church of Christ, Baptist, all these people, Catholics, out to... They had a Bonanza restaurant down here back years ago when Ron came to town. He had a bunch of Baptists and Church of Christ and... and uh, Pentecostals and you name it, he had him there. And all he was doing was looking for a way to finance his archaeological digs in the in the Middle East. That's all he's doing. See, when you get all those together, the Church of Christ don't agree with the Baptists, and the Baptists don't agree with the Catholics. And so he was never getting on any kind of doctrine. And I'll tell you why I don't believe in Ron Wright. He got up there and had a little film, and he showed on the little screen up there, he showed on the screen, they were at Noah's Ark National Park, and they were having a dedication service, and he was putting his approval on killing a goat and offering it a sacrifice at Noah's Ark National Park. I'm sorry, but there are no sacrifices anymore. Jesus was the one sacrifice offered once for all. And then Ron <clears throat> Wyatt asked, does anyone here have any questions? My hand's the first one to go up. I said, Ron, can you tell us about your experience with Jesus and when salvation came to your life? He went, well, well I don't even talk about that in public then you're a liar, mister. When he said something like that, and he claimed to have crawled under the Golgotha, nobody knows where Golgotha is over there. It was outside the city of Jerusalem. Nobody knows where it is because all of those sands blowing for thousands of years has covered it up. They'll announce and say, we're, we're, we're going on a tour over there and you can walk where Jesus walked. No, you can't. Where he walked is about 10 to 20 feet under that sand. It's blown over everything. That, that's what's crazy and insane. And they'll advertise all that and say that stuff. Don't believe everything you hear. And besides that, Ron White claimed to crawl under Golgotha and said he saw the literal Ark of the Covenant, but he's afraid to touch it because he might die. He was an ignoramus. He knew nothing about the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was blotted out. Our hearts are now they are because the Bible says, the Bible says that the Ark was sprinkled. Inside the Ark was the law written on tables of stone. Our hearts are sprinkled. And in our hearts are written the truth of God's word. So you can't, you cannot believe Ron White anything he said. I got his, I got his newspaper for a while and just stupid stuff. He doesn't know anything about the handwriting of ordinance being nailed to the cross. No, I didn't like Ron White. He was a liar and a cheat and a thief. And he was trying to gather people, Methodists and Church of Christ and Baptists and Pentecostals and Baptists, get them all to give offerings to his archaeological digs. No, I didn't like him. So you don't think Ron White found Jesus' blood and have it tested? No. You can't believe nothing Ron White said. Supposedly he did, and it only had chromosomes from his mother, Mary. <laughs> That's a funny statement. That's funny. Because you can't, 
you'd have to test Jesus' blood and then test her blood. And, and nobody knows where Mary's blood is. That is idiocy. Mark Walker writes to us on the man of sin, the head of the fire, and tree worship, changing times and laws. Y'all been reading chick, book, chick tracks too long. I read the Bible long before I read Jack Chick. I suggest you follow Archbishop Vagano <laughs> if you want to know the truth. You are a wacko. Oh, go, go Roman Catholic only. Um, oh, goodness gracious. Whoever you are, you're the wacko. Cindy Hahn writes on the eternal fire of Rome from Babylon to Pergamos to Rome to John Kennedy's grave. Could this be a, a strange fire in Leviticus 10.1? No. Oh, the strange fire. They were, they were sons of Aaron and they offered strange fire to the Lord. And they, it was their job to light. They offered incense on this altar of incense right here. And the candlesticks here, the table of showbread here, the Ark of the Covenant here, and the, and the brazen altar here, and the glass you see here. They were to take this incense and it had a special formula and they were not to get the fire from the brazen altar excuse me it had to come from the brazen altar and they probably looked at the candlestick and said well this is closer or they put the wrong formula in that and that was a strange fire they offered to God and God struck them dead which Aaron's sons brought to the Lord and got killed. I don't believe it. it was the eternal fire because the eternal fire was nowhere near here. That was down just southeast of Israel, of Jerusalem in the valley of Tophet. Then Lamont 8.14 writes, on 153 times 7 equals 1071, join heirs, righteous kings of Israel, David 14, the hand of God. This fellow can teach some good, real good gematria, which is his strong point. No, 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 the Bible is my strong point. However, his theology is way off on many points, and his video is an another example. God did not and does not create evil. You are, an, you are a stupid man. He said, I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. You don't believe that? You don't believe the Old Testament. I did a paper. And I did. There's about a hundred times on this paper that God says, I create evil. The Bible clearly states God is good. <laughs> That's such a dumb word. God is good. You mean agathos? Or what do you mean? Jesus clearly stated that. Isaiah 45, 7, God says, I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. You evidently don't like the Bible, do you? Evil is darkness and God is light and in him is no darkness or shadow of turning. Now, let me tell you something. People got messed up in their heads. You got the law here. Law. Man is under the law. This is the law. God is above the law. He can kill whoever he wants to and it's not against the law. He said, I kill, I make alive. I wound, I heal. I do what I want to do. Our God sits in the heavens. He does whatsoever he's pleased. And then he goes on to say, the Bible clearly states that God is good. What do you mean by good? We know that all things work together for good. Even the bad things. Jesus clearly stated that evil is darkness. He, he, this guy's rattling because of man's propensity towards sin at times. God put us in these sinful bodies and said, Thou shalt not, and the day you do, you'll die. He didn't say, If you do, Adam, he said, You will sin. I, I don't even want to read this. There is no evil in heaven, and God cannot create it. 
You just flat out deny the word of God. If you'll give us your address, I'll send you the God creates evil paper that I did. And it's nothing but scripture. It's got dozens and dozens of places where God says he brings evil. You sound like some poor excuse for a Christian. You go to the nice Christian church and we just talk about loving Jesus. And he talks about loving us too. I'm, let me see what he says. The word evil used in conjunction with God is an incorrect interpretation. You're stupid. They should stick with the translation and leave their editorial interpretations out of it. <laughs> you, you're, you belong in a circus, whoever you are. This kind of stuff is why so many slander God calling him the author of evil. He was. When it is clearly is the devil, the devil doesn't author anything, nothing. Everything is of God, all the evil and the good. I have no idea how you could read the Bible. I don't know how you could read it and come to the conclusion that God is the author of evil. You, you, listen, you read, you sound like a little kid in the in the kindergarten. Going, I don't think that's right. He'll stand before the throne someday and have to give an account for this. No, you'll stand and go to hell for what you're believing. To him, all, most everyone else is a cult or a false teacher. That's right. The Holy Spirit must be grieved at you. These people will most likely get to heaven, but will never ending up doing God's special will for their lives. Everybody does the will of God because of theology taught in ministries like this. I'm sure they do a lot of good, commendable works, but they will miss out on so much. I don't know who taught you. Did, did you go to elementary school to get that? Teaching you God? Jeffrey Lewis commented on America is Roman Catholic Political correctness, ecumenicalism, toleration, flattery. Maybe a stupid question, but what happens to someone who never hears the gospel? Oh, you mean like my next door neighbor? Because he doesn't have ears to hear? People think it's really terrible that somebody uh, on the Amazon River down in South America, what if they can't hear? What if my neighbor can't hear or live next door because God didn't give him ears to hear? The hearing ear and the seeing eye of the Lord has made him both of them. If he gives the hearing ear to some native that's 400 miles from the Amazon River down in the middle of the jungle, if he gives him ear to hear, God knows how to make him go fishing one day and stumble over a log and fall into a river and be carried down the river to some missionary to pull him out of the river and teach him the truth. God knows how to do that. You, you cannot come up and make excuse for people that can't hear. That's God's business, not ours. All right. That's enough reading, enough teaching for right now. I'll go into the lesson in a minute. I'm just tired of the preachers that don't care. I'm tired of people writing me letters and they say things that are stupid without checking in the Bible. If you don't think God creates evil, just look over there at Isaiah 45 and 7. That's when he called Cyrus in to slaughter the Babylonians and they killed hundreds of thousands of them. God says, I made this peace and created this evil. Now, I know you don't like that, but that's true. All right. We are on TV all over the country, in about 275 towns and cities, and uh, we're trying to get the word of predestination out to the world. Most people hate predestination. When I was 21, 22 years old, a guy walked up to me and two other guys in this church and he heard us talking about how God knows everything. We were really brilliant then. <laughs> he said, let me tell you boys something. 
he was about 26 or 27. He's older than us. And he said, let me tell you something. Here's what the Bible says. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. And I, I felt like he had hit me in the head with a ball bat. I went, whoa. I never heard that in my life. And, and then he walked away. And I said, wait a minute. You've got to come back here. You can't just say that and walk away. I never heard it. And then I began to base everything that I read on how God preordained everything righteously, mathematically structured. That's why predestination is ahead of everything. Jesus certainly is the reason for predestination, but the reason he died is to predestinate us to eternal life and to live godly and righteously. But... Uh, I'm just, I'm tired of the preachers. I'm sick of all of them. Everyone I hear. I used to be a follower of John MacArthur in the early 80s until I listened to him real close over the years. He's got so much error in his teaching. Pre-trib, rapture, millennium, uh, Christmas, Easter, uh, water baptism, crackers and grape juice that they call communion. I just... I'm sick of it. John, I'm ashamed of you that you would refuse to stand for the truth. I believe the reason he does this, he's got a seminary and he's got a bunch of professors in there that he's got to keep them paid. And he's got a church with a whole bunch of, of custodians and secretaries in it. He's got to keep them paid. And that's a tremendous overhead just to pay the help at a seminary probably 40 45 professors in that seminary and they can't all believe the truth and they don't i called out there one time i'd i had mailed about 85 cassettes to him and i called out there to try to talk to him and one of his helpers one of his assistants started talking to me. I said, I want to talk to John about predestination. And this guy said, we don't believe that here. I went, what? I said, your boss believes it, to a degree anyway. And uh, I just, how you can work with people that don't believe predestination, I don't understand that at all. Especially if you claim to believe it. We are... On TV all over the country, we're on the internet all over the world. We don't have a big crowd here, but most of our congregation is out in cyberspace. It's all over the world. There are people watching right now in California and Oklahoma and all over North Carolina and New York. And there are people that are watching, not a lot, because there's not a lot of people like this message. And we're trying to reach the world with this message, the world of the elect, I'll put it that way. <clears throat> and uh, we, we give away money each month to people that are needy and downtrodden. I, I give away about, I don't give it, you give it. We give away about $3,000 every month to the needy people who really believe these truths. I never give money to somebody that don't believe the truth. The Bible says we're to communicate to him that teacheth in all good things, and we communicate to them that learneth in all good things. You have to believe predestination, Christmas is pagan, and the rest of this in order to get help from us. I'm not going to give help to somebody, let them go out here and sin and die in their sin and go to hell. I'm not going to help them pay their rent to help get them into hell. But uh, I'm just, we try to help a lot of people. We give away money to various people. We give money to people that got cancer, a lady in Australia, a lady in Amarillo, Texas. And we give to the, the downtrodden. Uh, Danielle Thigpen is a lady in southern Louisiana. And she 
called me back several years ago and she said, I really love the message you're teaching. I found out that she was paraplegic, that she'd had a car wreck going to her mother's house one night and that she became paraplegic. That's where she can move from her waist up and can't move from her waist down. And she's been paraplegic for 15 years. She's 40 years old. That wreck happened when she's 25. And we put the word out to get a wheelchair accessible van. And we've we've come up with enough to buy one. They're up around eighty five to ninety thousand dollars and we're gonna buy her this van. This is hers. This is not going to ministry, to any part of operations or anything else. It goes to her. And uh, she's going through a government program. It's a rehab program, and she's, they're going to suggest what kind of van she needs, and they'll, it has a, a little remote that you punch a button, and the doors open the side, and the little ramp comes down, and she can drive her wheelchair up in there and go to the driver's seat. There won't be a seat there, but there'll be the starter and the brakes and the accelerator right there at the steering wheel and she'll be able to drive it and get a job. She sat in her father's house and looked at a wall for 15 years and said she was so depressed. When she found out about predestination that she could have one of these vans, and we've already got the money to buy it, and we're just going to her and uh, no one else, no other part of this ministry is going to get it. I'm the one that's I've got access to it, and nobody can convince me of anything to spend this money other than on her. And uh, as soon as she gets through this rehab program, we're going to get it for her. And uh, we love you. Uh, we love you, girl. You just keep on waiting on us and let us know, and we'll be there for you. Danielle, and uh, we got our picnic this weekend on Saturday the 15th down at Rockland Recreation Center. If you've ever come here and you want to come and join us, Rockland, Rockland Recreation Center, I'll draw it, I should have done this before. Uh, it's real close to the church, it's not far. If this is Gallatin Road and this is the church, Right across the street about here is McDonald's. And then right up here is the police station. Police station. That's just up across the street from us. If you go by the police station, where's Rockland Road? Well, they'll tell you, well, right here is the post office. And right here is a road that runs around from the post office. And Rockland Road is right there. It's just... And then Rockland Recreation Center is down here, goes to the left. There'll be a sign that says that right before you go over a bridge. So it's real close. It's right downtown Hendersonville. So come and join us. And if you want to bring some, bring some chili or something. It don't matter. Bring whatever you want to. And we're going to have a picnic. And we're going to enjoy fellowship. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Lord, sometimes it gets very discouraging believing these truths because very few people want the truth. It's very, very saddening to see a world that does not want to embrace the Word of God. Thank you for everything you do. And God will praise you for everything. Fight our battles for us. We've got so many enemies that want to stop us. No one can stop us except you. Thank you for your truth. In Christ's name, amen. I'm ready to teach. All right. Let me get me a, get me a Bible here.
I spill that out, that would be too long. I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I'm teaching to you something that I'm beginning to see. Everything that's evil is blended together in the Bible. And it blends with the method of salvation, which is the blood of Christ. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 4, Verse 2, you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, from the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Add is the word yasaf, Y-A-C-A-P-H. It means to augment or to add to. And diminish is the word gara. Gara. Gara means to shave off or take anything away from the Word of God. You know what I think of when I think of Gara? I think of predestination. Because the entire world has taken predestination out of the Word of God. Predestination. They have subtracted that from the Word of God. And they've added all these other things to the Word of God. We're going through a lot of the things they've added. Demon starts in the garden. America is Roman Catholic. Now, I keep saying that and people will wonder, what do you mean Roman Catholic? Roman Catholicism was founded on the doctrine of tolerance. Everybody's got to tolerate everybody else's doctrine. That's going on in the world today when the people say you've got to be politically correct. Do not offend anyone. They have their constitutional rights. The Bible says we are to offend people continually that will not live righteously and godly. The Bible says many times the Word of God is pure. It's not to be altered. You can't add to it. I'm seeing all the churches of the world are adding to the Word of God. When Constantine started the Roman Catholic Church, started it by issuing an edict in 312 A.D. That was called the Edict of Toleration or the Edict of Milan. Toleration or the Edict of Milan, M-I-L-A-N. And that Edict of Milan, the reason he issued it, he said, I want everyone to tolerate one another. He was, in a, he was in a place where he could lose the empire because he had all these Huns. He had these, these Ostrogoths and Visigoths and Goths. And he had all of these Vandals, people coming from the Far East, rampaging across what would later become the European continent. And they were just literally marauding through the world. 
And Constantine was the head of the empire here in Rome. He had amalgamated the Eastern Empire from Constantinople with the Western Empire in Rome, made it one empire that was ruling over the entire civilized world, which is the world of the Mediterranean Sea. And he said, I cannot control these rampaging people that are barbaric. And he was having a problem with the church that had started uh, by the 12 apostles, and it was scattering all over the world. And they were trying to slaughter the church, and he couldn't keep them in control because they kept multiplying. So he said, I will bring all these pagan gods into the church at Rome, and I will also bring all the Christians in the world that will come and be a part of this polluted church. That way I can have the pagans in here and I can have the so-called Christians in here. And he organized the Roman Catholic Church there. Now, the Roman Catholic Church didn't happen all of a sudden. Everything that was in the Roman Catholic Church came about over a long period of time. But it was all due to that that edict that he made, he said, let's, let's give this edict and tell all the world you can come in the church, you have to accept what everybody else believes and you cannot ever speak up against them. You have to accept what they want to believe. That's what's going on in the world today with political correctness. You Baptists can't call down the Pentecostals and you Baptists can't call down the Church of Christ, and everybody needs to get along. And that's called ecumenicalism, E-C-U, C-U, ecumenical, M-E-N-I-C-A-L-I-S-M. That's been, it's been touted or been advertised that the man that was responsible more for this than anyone in the world was Billy Graham. He tried to pull Roman Catholicism and all of the Protestant world back together. He even claimed that in the early 50s that he was trying to pull it together. That's one of the reasons I don't see how he could be a believer because he just simply, he put, he put, uh, he had these altar workers in all of his crusades and they would and the word was out i had a lady tell me in cincinnati she said i was one of the altar workers when he came to cincinnati and he said they have all the workers to meet in a common place and they meet in a place and they have instructors in the billy graham crusade that as soon as the organ hits the notes on the end of his message and starts to play just as I am, the first notes that's hit, all these altar workers are to walk down into the front and meet people down there so they can work with them at the altar. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. This one woman told me, she said, every, every, when I walked down to the front, everybody I talked to was an altar worker. She said, that's why people start streaming to the front. That's altar workers. These are not people convicted of their sin. And she said, I didn't hardly ever meet anybody that came down to get their life right with the Lord. Well, Billy Graham, and then whenever they'd walk down there and they'd have some kind of encounter, they would take their name, their phone number, their address, and they'd give it back to the respective churches. I've got all kinds of of uh, documentation. They'd give it to a Baptist church if they come out of a Baptist church. They'd give the name back to a Catholic church or to a church of Christ or to a Pentecostal church, wherever, and send them right back into the same mess they were in. Well, I'm trying to show you this all was going on. The first sins that happened was a demon sin. They were the temptation of the tree in the garden. Demons were the temptation of the tree. What do you mean by that? It was Satan's doctrine. The temptation of the tree has to do with demons. And it was the temptation. It was Satan's doctrine or the mark the mark, it was an addition. It was the mark of the beast. 
It was the addition to the Word of God that the Bible specifically states you cannot add anything. Everything we've been talking about in addition. A blood baptism was in the garden to cover the sins of Adam and Eve. Demon, we've been talking about that. Demon has to do with baptism. Baptism was in the garden. Demon is the word daemonion, D-A-I-M-O-N, I-O-N. Daemonion is our word demon, demon. Daemonion means it comes from dio, meaning to distribute fortunes. I didn't say that. The Bible says that. Now, in the first century, in the first century, demons were not what we call today demons. Demons were ancestors. This was the same thing as ancestor worship. They were ancestors who had died, and they would come back, and they were good demons, good demons, and bad demons. This is not something I've done. This is something that any sociologist has, has studied, that has studied history. This is what they will tell you. There were good demons and bad demons. You can see that in cartoons and bad demons. You see it in cartoons on the shoulder of Bugs Bunny a little angel in his right ear with a halo over his head. Of course, the halo is the sun god, and that's a bad depiction. But with a little halo over his head, whispering uh, good things in this ear, and a little demon with horns on this in, in this ear. That's exactly where it was in the first century. Good demons and bad demons. And the demons were what they called, all the pagans called their gods demons. I could sit and read that over and over again. Out of all of these, I've got so much paper on that, so much documentation off of the Internet and out of books that this is what they did. Now, demon, what was in the tree that was a demon? The Bible says in 1 John, 1 John 2.16, this is what the Bible says. All that's in the world, all in the world, is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the, well, I ain't got enough room to write that, and the pride of life, pride of life. That's, this is demon here. And the pride of life. This is what Eve saw in the tree. She saw a tree that was good for food. And demon has been added to the word of God. There's no such thing as demons. There never have been. That was man's excuse to get the blame off himself, to invent these gods that come up and did good and bad. It was actually... What it is, it's just a counterfeit of the inner and the outer man. The inner man serves the law of God, and the outer man is our fleshly man. It's our flesh that serves the law of the flesh. That's what, that is just nothing but, it's a picture of the bad demon, the flesh, and the good demon, the inner man, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's nothing but it's a counterfeit of the real thing, which is flesh, self, and the new birth, which is Christ in us. They conjured up this thing to call them demons. But they're not the only ones that did that. And, it, and the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Eve saw a tree that was good for food. This is the tree that was in the middle of the garden. You, let me move this here. Oh, sure, I'm glad that moves around. This was the tree that was in the midst of the garden. There's a garden there in the beginning, and there's a tree in the middle of the garden, 
And the tree in the middle of the garden has the same thing that the Bible says everything that's in the world that you want to distribute the fortunes of this world to, the Bible says is the lust of the flesh. Lust is the word epithumia, E-P-I-T-H-U-M-I-A. Now, I want you to remind yourself all the time we're talking about this. These are the additions to the Word of God, and there's nothing to be added to the Word of God. When man comes up with the lust of his flesh, the lust of the eye, Eve saw a tree that was good for food. It would fulfill the lust of the flesh. Epithumia, lust, means to long for that which is forbidden. That is unlawful. You, just because you can find man that wants to say it's okay to lust, it's not. Lust of the eye, long for forbidden. And what do you mean to long for forbidden? It's in the very definition. Epi means to superimpose upon yourself. Epi to cover yourself with thumos, breathing hard, hard breathing. I want that car, I want that woman, I want that house, and I don't care what I have to do to get it, I want it. That's lust. And pride, that's lust of the eyes. And she saw a tree that was pleasant to the eye. Pleasant to the eye. And pride of life, she saw a tree that would make her wise, that is what was in the tree in the midst of the garden. That is the mark. The mark of the beast is not is not a computer chip in your head and in your hand. That's not it at all. It is what was in the garden. It's nothing new under the sun. It's been here since the garden. I wrote SF. P B. We know what that stands for. Sword, famine, pestilence, and the beast. God says, when you go after things in the world, you go after the lust of the flesh. I'm going to send the sword. I'll send the war against you. I'll send the famine. That'll be a that'll be a, a shortage of food. I'm going to send the pestilence. That'll be disease. And I'm going to send the beast, the Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. The first beast, all of this was in the garden. God put a sword at the gate of the garden to keep men going back in, keep Adam from going back in and eating of the tree of life and living forever. He sent famine into the garden because he said, he said, you're going to earn your bread by tilling the ground by sweating the sweat of your brow and that is that is famine and the pestilence was death he said if you eat you'll die and they died spiritually and the beast was there the serpent not cause in a-c-h-a-s-h not cause the, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field the beast was ruling in the garden. Who was he ruling? Adam and Eve. God said, Thou shalt not. And Adam and Eve said, Well, the amazing thing to me, she could have said to the, to the serpent, My husband says I can't eat, but she didn't. She listened to good words and fair speeches. That's what Paul said. Leads people away as good words and fair speeches lead a man away. Don't listen to easy words that men say. So the good words and the fair speeches was Satan just simply saying, this is where he added to the word of God. When, when Constantine wanted everybody to hold hands, he wanted evil to hold hands with good all through the first century, all through the uh, fourth century, he wanted good and evil to hold hands together and come members in the church at Rome. Everybody get along together. That's what it was about. Now, cost the serpent means to enchant. And the only way you get to go after all that's in the world is to feel good about it. Feel good. And God said, I'm not going to put up with that. 
Adam and Eve tried to be saved by by a fig tree leaves, fig tree. They took fig tree leaves and covered their nakedness. God says, that's not good enough. I've got to have a blood baptism. Blood baptism is everything. And that was in the garden. Blood baptism was in the garden. God says, I've got to kill an animal and cover your nakedness. They covered themselves with the works of their hands and they had nothing to do with that. And God says you have to have a blood baptism and that is what this is all about. We've been going through baptism. It started in the garden when God killed, he probably killed a lamb. I believe that's what he killed, a lamb, and covered their nakedness with this skin of the lamb. That's where baptism started. We've been talking about demons were the temptation of the tree. And that was the mark of the beast, and the beast was the serpent. What amazes me is this word serpent is not the common word serpent. It just means to enchant. It has the basic same meaning as the dragon in Revelation. Dragon is the word dracon, d R-A-K-O-N. It means to fascinate. That's the only way you think you can get by with all that's in the world. And all that's in the world was the mark of the beast. Mark is the word C-H-A-R-A-G-M-A in the book of Revelation. Karagma means character. What is the character of the beast? It is to lead you away and go after all that's in the world and no death to self, to go after cars and things and houses and stuff and me. It takes giving up spiritual things and going after the flesh. So they had to kill a lamb to cover their nakedness. And that's what this is all about. It's about the mark of the beast. Mark of the beast, karagma, means character. It's the character of the beast. And from karagma, we get the word karax, C-H-A-R-A-X. And karax means stake on a boundary line. And God set off that tree in the middle of the garden and put a boundary around it and said you cannot go after all that's in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life you can't go after that and when they went after that that's what the mark of the beast the, the character of the beast is stuff and things of the flesh that's all it is and it holds true all the way through the Bible. There had to be a baptism in the garden. There had to be a high priest in the garden. You cannot offer a sacrifice anywhere in the Bible without having a priest. That's particularly a high priest. Let me just give that to you. There had to be a high priest. When the Bible says Jesus was a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Order, order is the word T-A-X-I-S. It's a form of the word T-A-S-S-O. -S -S I mentioned that word earlier, announcing this lady's disease that she has, ataxia. Taxis is the word order. Order means orderly arrangement. Orderly arrangement. If Jesus was a priest after the order, order of Melchizedek, order doesn't mean what you might think it means. 
An order of taxes was a fixed succession of priests. That is an order. If you go down here to the to the lodge, some lodge down the street, and you go in there and look on the wall, they'll have high potentate of 1929. Then they'll have high potentate of 19. 30 or 31 or 32, whenever they change priests, 32. And then they have high potentate of 34. And it would go down the line when they change these priests. This was a taxis. You had many people that served in that position. Well, Jesus was a priest forever after a taxis of Melchizedek. And that means there were other men that held that order. And that means if he was a priest forever, he was the only one in the garden that was allowed to offer a sacrifice for Adam and Eve and could kill that lamb and clothe them with that lamb. Now when you get when you all through the Old Testament you've got certain men that are offering sacrifice to God. You had you had God offering sacrifice. That had to be the off that had to be the office of Melchizedek. That was God or Jesus that talked to Adam in the garden and offered this sacrifice for Adam and for Eve because they died spiritually. And then you go on down here and you find Abel offering a blood sacrifice. He must have been carrying this office of Melchizedek because you had to be a priest to offer. Then if you go on down, Noah comes out of the ark Noah comes out of the ark. I believe it's passed from one man to the other. And then Noah had a son, Shem, and he was blessed of God, and he outlived Abraham, who was down the road, 600 miles down, 600 miles, not miles, 600 years down the road, somewhere in that neighborhood. And, and Shem was offering sacrifices. I believe he held the order of Melchizedek. And then you get on down here to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When any one of them offered sacrifices, they had to be carrying on this lineage of Melchizedek. And then Jacob has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve sons. Then you had, then at this point, the priesthood shifts. It goes from, it goes from Melchizedek to the priests here, which was the third born of Jacob, Levi. Then you have the Levitical priesthood, and that is what takes place all the way to the death of Jesus, death of Jesus. And at the death of Jesus, then the Melchizedek priesthood begins again. And that is because everything from the Old Testament, when he was nailed to the cross, that was nailed with him. So from Levi until the death of Jesus, and then Jesus ascends into heaven, and he becomes the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The reason he's forever is because he was the priest back here. He was back here in the garden. It had to be a high priest offering a lamb in order to cover the sins of Adam and Eve. And that was a blood baptism. It wasn't water. We said the other day when I preached on this that the water was added by, was added by the Pharisees. Anybody who adds to the Word of God is adding, that's blasphemy. 
the tongues that were added by the Pentecostals. That's blasphemy. Tongue is not, is not, Pentecostal tongues is not a biblical truth. Pentecostal healing is not true. Boy, it's awful hard to go out and say these things, especially when you can prove it to them by the Scripture. Tongue, gloss, and dialectos. That is not jibber-jabber that they're doing in these Pentecostal churches. Faith healing is not true. Slain in the Spirit is just as, that's adding to the Word of God. The Spirit quickeneth. Quicken, zupal, means to make alive. It doesn't kill people. C-O-P-O-I-E-O. I'm talking about, it seems like every church in the world is added to the Word of God. The Baptists have added something. They've added two things that confused me as a little kid like nothing in the world had ever confused me. They added, accept Christ as your personal Savior. And the Bible says when you're dead in sin, you cannot do that. The Bible says over there in Isaiah 64 that there is none that stirreth up himself. That calleth upon, there's none that calls upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of God. None calls on the name of the Lord when he's dead in sin. Calls on name. And that stirreth up himself, stirreth up, up, which is the word U-W-R, means to wake from the dead. Nobody calls upon God, first of all, to wake himself from the dead, to take hold of God. Nobody does that. That goes along with Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's true. But how shall they call on him and whom they not believe? Belief has to precede calling. How shall they call on him and whom they not believe? That's like saying... I'm going to pray to Zeus anymore. I'm not going to pray to Zeus. I don't believe he's there. I don't believe he is a he. I don't believe he's a being. So why would I pray to Zeus? Why would a man pray to Jesus or to Jehovah God that he didn't believe in him? And it just bothers me. I did a, I did a search on, on sinner's prayer. And I came up with a lot of material off the internet. And the Southern Baptist Convention had a meeting one time on whether the sinner's prayer was the method of salvation. You don't have to meet on that. The Bible says, Romans 10, 10, 14, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? They've added that to the Word of God. They've added... Accept Christ to the Word of God. You can't accept Christ when you're dead in a casket. When you're dead in sin, you cannot accept Christ. I've been talking to you about all the things they've added to the Word of God. The, the Pentecostals have added the tongues. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard, especially when you study the Greek text. Glossa and dialectos. I've said this so many times. Glossa and dialectos are the two words. D-I-A-L-E-K-T-O-S. Dialectos is the word dialect. Dialect. Gloss is the word foreign language. Those are the only two words in the Greek text. When these guys will come up with glossolalia, G-L-O-S-S-A-L-I-A, that is not in the Bible. It's a form of glossa, and they'll tell you, well, they have glossolalia in Hindu temples. Glossolalia is not in the Greek. It's glossa, foreign language. Get our word glossary from that. I've never been so tired of people adding to the Word of God. I don't know why God has come to me and told me, you need to investigate all these 
things. I have, I've been investigating these truths for a long time. If you believe in demons, I'm going to go ahead and say this again. If you believe in demons, you must. You, you have to believe in genies. That's something they've added to the Bible. When you're in Israel, in ancient Israel, and they believed in demons in the first century, and you go over to the Arab nations, they call the same thing in, among the Arabs. They call them genies, and genie comes from the word gene. Genie is the word gene, and that is your ancestry. That's your ancestry. And the Jews said demons were their ancestors. That was their ancestors that were deified as gods. Little G O D S. Since they were little gods, they weren't the same big time gods that they had in uh, Rome or in Greece in the pantheon of gods. Pantheon comes from pan. Pan means all. A pantheon was a temple for all the gods. We've got a pantheon out here in, in the, the park out here in the uh, Pantheon Park out here. That's why Nashville is called the Athens of the South because we're an educational center. So they built a pantheon out there exactly like the one in Greece. And it's got a it's got a goddess in there, Diana, and she's supposed to be holding uh, Nike, the Nike, we call it Nike, uh, the little god in her hand. She's inside there. I've gone in there and looked at it. And if you believe in genies, then you have to believe in fairies. These are all the same. Fairies were among the Celts. That's the English people that practiced the Druids. And those were gods, and that was their ancient ancestors. And if you believe in fairies, you have to believe if you believe in demons and genies and fairies, and they're the same thing in different cultures, what do you get from fairies? Wishes. Wishes. What do you get from genie? Three wishes. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That's what you get. Three wishes. That's what you get from genies. And you get wishes from fairies. You have the you got good fairies and bad fairies. You had good genies and bad genies. They even make movies showing some genies are real good and then some of them are trying to destroy people. And they have the same thing among the fairies. Drew the and among the fairies you got all kinds of gods. There some are good gods and some are bad gods. Wait a minute. That's what we said. Notice how all this connects together. That's what we said when, when they come to, I don't want to cover all of it, but when you come to the winter so when you come to the, uh, the end of the harvest, end of harvest, and that's in September, October, they said that the sap was drawn down into the ground, this is what the pagans said, by evil gods, by evil demons, by evil fairies. And that there were good gods that were up here, and that was Hercules and, and Adonis, and these good gods that was going to retain the land until they got to got back through the deadly part of winter and the good gods looked over everything and the evil gods were destroying everything the evil gods were like Hades that was a god we know it's actually a word for hell and they had Hades and Pluto Pluto and they had a, just a list of the evil gods the same thing as they said the fairies and the genies and the demons were then if you 
if you uh, go to the uh, the Greeks, they called the same thing guardian angels. There's no such thing as guardian angels. Why does God need guardian angels when he's declared the end from the beginning and from ancient times everything that's not done yet? Why does he need angels to guard anything? There's no such thing. And then if you go on further than that, you go to the Romans, they called them genius. Genius. A specially gifted person, special gift. Notice it all has to do with, with gifts and presents and what you want, and that has to do with Christmas. And then if you go to the American Indian, they call them totems. Totem, when you look that up in the Hastings Encyclopedia, look up totem, it'll say, it will say, kinfolk. And if you have a totem pole, and you've got all these different animals on the totem pole, you'll have a wolf up here and a, and a deer here or an elk, and then you'll have an otter here and so forth. If your family is that, if, one of your, if your family is a wolf, then you don't ever kill a wolf and you look after them and you take care of them. That's what a totem pole is about. It was about ancestor worship. The first ancestor worship I ever heard of was Shintoism. When I was a little kid, I heard that Shintoism was ancestor worship of the Japanese. Of the Japanese. And that was, they worshipped hundreds of gods on their mantles. They kept them on their shelves there. What I want to talk to you about is baptism is a necessary a blood baptism has always been since the garden the method of covering the sin of the people. It's just, I'm just, when you look up the word vampire over in the, in the, uh, I've got some of it over here. Let me see here. I can't even give you all this. There's so much to it. What I do? I'll put it over here. You look up vampire. All this is on demons or fairies or or the like. I've got. Let me let me get this so I can show it to you. And demon. Every time you found the word goat in the Old Testament, the word s i y r s i y r. Every time you find the word goat, when they translated it into the Septuagint LXX, that is the Greek form of the Old Testament, around 200 B.C., B.C., they translated goat, D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N. -O -N -O -N. They translated it demon. In fact, you've got all these places in the Old Testament. When the Bible speaks, and I noticed this years ago, I defined the word. That, speaking of Israel, but ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, which was Zion, that prepare a table for that troop. And the, I noticed this years ago. The word troop is Gad. That was one of the gods and it means to distribute fortunes. So when they translated Gad, they translated it Deamanion. And then when you get into all these others, turn ye in Leviticus 19 and, and 4, turn ye not unto idols. The word is Elio, E L I Y L, E L I Y L. And when they translated that into Septuagint, they translated daemonion or demon. And they did the same thing with every time they had idols in there as well as goat, they translated daemonion. They didn't have demons in the Old Testament. They did, they did twice. They mentioned the word shed, S-H-E-D. 
And all these were ancestor worshipers. The word appears two times in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 32, 17. They sacrificed unto demons. The word is shed. It just meant idol gods. To gods whom they knew not, in Psalms 106, 37, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto idols or demons. It don't mean they were true. And that would take you back over to this will help you to understand this. That'll take you back to a verse that I have read for years and I've never had anybody comment on it. But it's in Acts 17th chapter. Paul was at, he had made his way on this journey and he made his way to Athens. Athens was right over here. Right there. As Athens. He's on this journey coming down here to Athens. And outside of Athens is a place called Mars Hill. And that was a place they kept all their gods. All their gods. And when he's at Athens, he comes up and meets two men. One's an Epicurean. These people are just pagan worshipers. One is a Stoic, the two men. And he says, and this proves to you what they called their gods. They called them demons, demonion. And he says here in chapter 7, 17, chapter 17, verse 16, now while Paul waited for He's, taught, he's waiting for Silas and Timothy to come to Athens where he is. And he's facing all these pagans here. And he runs into a couple of them. And while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. He saw the city completely wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews... It's the Jews he's fighting. It's not the pagans. <laughs> That's what gets me. With the devout persons in the daily market daily, with them that met with him. Then Paul all of a sudden runs into two men. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans, I don't know if it was two or not, it mentions two, two philosophies. Certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered Paul, and some said, what will this babbler say? They call Paul a babbler because he's preaching Christ, and he's sitting right in the middle of Athens where they have nothing but idolatry and gods. And what will this babbler say? Some, others, some. He seemed to be set forth of strange gods. Strange is the word kinezo. Remember the word kinezo? It comes from kazinos, meaning stranger. He seems to be a set forth of strange gods. And they called Jehovah a strange D A I M. O-N, O-N. That means if they're calling Jehovah strange gods, then they may, that means they've got demons, which is what they called all of their gods there at Athens and in Corinth and in, and in Rome. Anytime they spoke of their gods, they called them daemonion. So they're saying, this Paul is talking to us about a strange demon. The fact that they would say strange means they had their own demons that weren't strange. And that was that would be all the gods of the Greeks and the Romans. They called them all demonion. And proof of that again, well, let's go ahead and read the rest of this. What will this babbler say? And they said he seems to be a setter forth of strange demons. I don't know why they didn't translate that demons instead of gods. All that, all that did was slide people away from looking at the truth about this. Because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. They called Jesus a strange demon. 
And they took him and brought him into Ropagus, saying, May we know that this, what this new doctrine is? They called Jesus' resurrection of the dead a new doctrine. Wherefore thou speakest is, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing about one of these gods. They're in a, they're in a cemetery of some kind or some place with all these monuments and they've got uh, this god and this god over here and it's everything from Venus or Aphrodite or, or Hercules and they've got these posted all over the place. And then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. That's where they had all these gods. I can't imagine what it was like. It looked like a bunch of tombstones with the name of the dead god there. And this was their demons. And Paul said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. I love the word superstitious. DC. Because Paul is referring to their gods. D C D E I S I D A I M O N E S T E R O S. Notice Daemon right in the middle of that. D C Daemonesteros means it comes from Delia, D E I L I A, which means timid or fear, timid or fear of your God, your demons, fear of demons, your gods. He said, "You have a fear of your demons." Well, that's exactly what's wrong with the church in America. Everybody says, well, I believe, a lot of people say, I believe you, Jim Brown, but I'd be Billy, be Billy Graham too. I just want to retain both of you in case one of you is right. I'm sorry, one of us is wrong. And I believe it's Billy. So, and then you look back over here at, look back over here at Romans 10. He, he, this is second proof that they call their gods by the title of demons. Revelation 10. Romans. Uh, now Romans. Not Romans. First Corinthians 10. Excuse me. I don't know what makes me do that. I just kind of say things once in a while to get something on my mind. 1 Corinthians 10, and then he says, look at verse 18. Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. Now that's exactly what the priests of God did. They had a flesh hook. They would dip down in that altar after they'd offered a sacrifice and they'd eat what's in the altar. That's an amazing thing. Let me read the rest of this. What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered to idols is anything? Even if they offered things to their idols, there's nothing wrong with eating it, unless somebody's watching you, and they know it was offered to idols. Don't make their flesh to stumble. Then he says, but I say, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to... Deamonion. It says devils, but the word is deamonion. They sacrifice to demons. That's proof that they call their gods demons. And not to God. I would not that you should have fellowship with deamonion or people who want to distribute fortunes. That's what the word means. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. That's very plain. Drinking the cup of the Lord meant death to sell. If you, to drink of a cup meant to undergo a violent death. Jesus asked James and John, can you drink the cup that I drink of? And he said, 
And they said, yes, we can. He said, you will. And he said, you can't drink the cup of the Lord and die to self and drink the cup of devils, which is fulfill self, which means to to go after the world, to distribute fortunes. You cannot distribute fortunes and kill fortunes. He's not saying, I won't allow this. He says it's not, it's kind of like saying, you can't be on the bottom of a building on the top at the same time. You can't die to self and fulfill self at the same time. There's no possible way. Now, we can see that. I was going to go through, I've got some papers here. It's all on blood baptism. Here's one that I've got. It's on fairies. Fairies comes out of this article on fairies. I've got some papers on it. I'll be glad to share them with everybody. But this comes out of out of Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion. And it starts off and says, Fairies or elves, E-L-V-E-S, may be described at this stage is a non-human race. Well, that's their opinion, but they're not a race at all, their imagination. The belief in whom is mainly known as it exists among the Celts and the Teutons, the Teutonic people, the people way up north, uh, the Vikings and so forth. There is little difference in it, in attributes, characteristics, and actions between Celtic fairies and Teutonic or Scandinavian elves, dwarves, and trolls. The trolls were wicked elves. Those are the more bad elves. And then he goes on down here and he says, they were fairy-like beings which Arabs Hindus, Chinese, and savages of all regions believed in more or less supernatural beings. Celtic and Teutonic fairy superstition, thus, though the popular idea of fairies is, is that of a supernatural race existing in the fancy of the folk of the North and Western Europe. He goes on to say, while the popular idea mainly regards the fairies whose occupation it is to dance in the moonlight. That's like the guy that called his son a lunatic in Matthew, the 17th chapter. My son is a lunatic. Well, does that mean he was a lunatic? Does that mean his son was moonstruck because the man said so? No, it doesn't mean that. Moonstruck. Lunatic comes from lunar, which is the word moon. The man walks up to Jesus and says, my son is struck by the moon. Well, that means he would be a vampire or a werewolf. Werewolves and vampires go back a long time prior to Christ. Bram Stoker didn't start the werewolf thing when he wrote his Dracula thing. He didn't start that. That is thousands of years old. And fairies of the wood or stream or parts of nature. And then he goes on down here and he says something really interesting. The Romance languages, the words for fairy, feta, or fate, or fee, from fatum came the Latin fatare to enchant. Fairy has the same meaning as the word serpent in Genesis 3 and 1. In fact, when you study like I've studied on the fairies and on the demons and all this, you're going to run into King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And the be all of the historians, even the witches who will teach you about fairies, they will tell you that they'll give you a class of all these people in a position that King Arthur was a picture of the Messiah who was over the land as long as they took care of the land and he had the sword 
the sword that they pulled out of the rock, that the sword was a type of the word of God. It was an anti-type. And the rock was a type of anti-type of Christ. It was an opposing type. And then when they had Morgan Le Fay, Morgan Le Fay was Arthur's sister. Sometimes he was Arthur's, she was Arthur's lover. It was her that Arthur's supposed to have had intimate sexual relationship with that brought about her bastard son. And what was his name? Uh, I can't think of it all of a sudden. But anyway, he was a bastard son. And Morgan Le Fay comes from Moore, M-O-O-R, M-O-O-R, and La Fay, L-A-F-E-Y. La Fay means the fairy. The fairy. Moore is the word sea. This means the sea fairy or the sea, the water demon or the water god. And the water god in the Bible is Tammuz. When you see Tammuz in that eighth chapter of M.U.Z., that's Tammuz or it's Dagon. Dagon of the of the uh, the Philistines. Dagon, D A G O N, comes from the word dog, which is the word fish. And that was the fish god, and that was all patterned after Noah when he come out of the ark. So whether it's evil, you got evil fairies, and you got good fairies. It's you say, what is this all about? It's all a confusion of the additions to the Word of God. They've added all this. And then if you get on, this is a, if you've got the, if you've got the Hastings, this is worth looking up and reading because what they do in the ferry, they interchange demons, they interchange guardian angels, they'll say guardians, they interchange genius and totem. You're going to find totem in nearly every culture. It's not just American Indian. It's in every culture, every superstitious culture of the world. In fact, I've got these books on fairies, and it tells you all about these things, all about the totems, the genies, and the demons. They're all the same thing. Then I've got this book called Dictionary of Deities and Demons. And they tell you that they tell you that possessed with devils was was a, a word that meant to be insane. That's possessed with devils is the word demonizomai, D-A-I-M-O-N. I wish I could go through all this with y'all personally, but it's impossible to get through everything I've got. I've studied and researched this for years. If you believe in demons, you've got to believe in all of this because they're the same thing in different cultures. That's the way it is, whether you like it or not. And then DC Diamond... No, not DC. Demonizomai. D A I M O N I Z O M A I. That's the word possessed with devils. With devils. All this is, all this is, when you look this up in any number of books I got, particularly the McClinic and Strong. It tells you it means to be insane. Was well, the world insane? I think most of the preachers in America are insane. Insane is a real simple word. You look it up in Webster's Dictionary, it will tell you to be crazy, deranged, 
when you look all these up, you'll end up with unsound, and Paul speaks of, of having a sound mind, unsound. And the general definition means the inability to think rationally. The Baptists can't think rational because they think accept Christ is in the Bible. They think sinner's prayer is the way to salvation, and it's not. The Pentecostals can't think rational because they believe in speaking in that jibber-jabbering, ungodly, so-called tongue they speak in. And they believe in faith healing when the Bible teaches against that. The Bible doesn't say Jesus healed people for their sake. It says he healed people to prove who he was. That's it. Why would he tiptoe up to a man there at the pool of Bethesda and say, Well, thou me made whole when there had been 30 or 40 people there? He could have said, Would all of you people like to be healed? But he didn't. It's... Preachers are insane when they add to the Word of God and they don't care what they do. They have added demons to the Word of God. They started in the ancient world and they came up with the idea that they were various things. I'm trying to point out a lot of the places that people, I can't even get into, everything in here is on demons. And this comes out of all these different books. When how are demons? Here's one on vampires. This is on vampires. A vampire may be redefined, may be defined as the spirit of a dead person, his corpse reanimated by his own spirit. Who has the power of resurrection? Jesus said, "I am the resurrection and the life." Or by a by a demon. It's a demon that brings him back to life. Returning to sap the life of the living by depriving them of blood. Now, wait a minute. That's a vampire. That's a Roman Catholic that deprives people of blood and wants to drink blood, right? That's Roman Catholicism. This forms a particular aspect of the general belief that ghosts or spirits may be may set may be sent by sorcerers and can annoy the living in various ways or cause their sickness or death. The vampire is often one of which has died an untimely death, and on whose life is unhappy or dead sorcerer or wizard or other obnoxious person. He goes in to talk all about him, and he says a malicious spirit might be taken possession of a corpse and vitalize it for sinister purposes. To prevent the return of the dead, which, whether bodily or as a ghost, many precautions were used in closing the grave with a high fence piling heavy stones upon it, diverting the course of a stream. Now get this. Diverting the course of a stream. This is water baptism that gets rid of demons. Diverting the course of a stream in order to bury in its bed and then permitting it to flow as before, binding the corpse. It flows over the corpse. That would be a picture of water baptism, wouldn't it? To keep the dead in his place. That is a parallel to blood baptism that retains us. It's, it's, it happened in all these other, other uh, times. And then he goes on to say, The corpse is revitalized and thirst for blood. It ravages begin with relatives, then it attacks other victims, and these to turn become in turn become vampires. Its ravages occur by night. People love dark men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That's the same thing as a vampire. 
Its ravages occur by night. The grave must be re-entered by cockcrow, else the vampire must remain wherever he is stiff and helpless. And it tells you down here how to get rid of one. Lest the vampire should have embodied itself in one of them, do resume its foul work. This was done among the Slavs. That's where that's where Dracula's come from, the Slavic countries. Bulgaria and Slav, Slav, Slavica or whatever it is. This was done among the Slavs in Bulgaria. A sorcerer armed with a saint's picture, a Roman Catholic saint's picture, is supposed to drive the vampire into a bottle containing some of its foul food and when corked up, the bottle is thrown in the fire and you don't let any bugs crawl out of the fire because it could turn into a vampire. That's the stupidity of that stuff. And that's what they've added to the Word of God. All that is an addition. Now, I had some other things I wanted to say on baptism. So we've talked about the vampires. We've talked about the genies and the, and the fairies. If you believe in these, every time you find Damonion in the New Testament, whether it's in Luke 8, in Mark 5 or Matthew 5, where the man is supposedly to be the demoniac, the Bible says he was possessed with devils and he was insane. He was crazy. Now, I was talking to you about baptism and how it cannot possibly be H2O. I said this last time. Let me finish it up, and I didn't finish it. Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize. He has to be talking about water. He has to be. Let me show you how I arrange things in my thinking. Let's go back over there to first. How much time do I have, Mike? Let's go back over to back over to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. I'm going to try to spell something out for you and see if I can align it the way it needs to be. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. Paul says, verse 14, I thank God that I baptize none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Now, why would he thank God that he didn't baptize people with water if God had told the apostles, go into all the world, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Would that apply to Paul if that's what God was talking about? If he's talking about water, wouldn't it apply to Paul? But he turns around and says the next verse, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. So when he said go into all the world and baptize, that's the, that's the great commission. He couldn't have been talking about water. No possible way. Because when Paul said Christ sent me not to baptize, because he said I baptize, E-B-A-P-T-I-Z-O, the, the epsilon means I did the baptizing. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. I did it. Christ sent me not. This is called an augment. A-U-G-M-E-N-T. That's called an augment. The e So That's not normally used. It, did God send Paul to do the same thing he sent the apostles to do? Well, let's just read that over there in Matthew 28. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Matthew 28, he says, Go into all the world and teach all nations. Matthew 28. And let's look at this great commission.
Verse 18, And Jesus came and, say, and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. He can't be talking about water because there is, he's got a baptism of his own that the Bible calls Holy Ghost and fire. John came baptizing with water. And, but John said, there comes one after me, speaking of Jesus, he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now, a man named Zeno started something called Stoicism. S-T-O-I-C-I-S-M. That was around 320 B.C. That was in that neighborhood. And he said all the universe was a cosmos, K-O-S-M-O-S. -S. Cosmos means a living, breathing entity. He said everything in this universe was a living entity. And he said what, what he said, this is 300 years before Jesus, he said what gave the, all this breathing entity was Haggai's, was Numa, was Numa, P-N-E-U-M-A, and purr and fire was what gave it life to the cosmos was holy pneuma and fire holy ghost pneuma is breath purr is the word fire when you get to john the baptist in matthew the the third chapter and he says the one that comes after me will have baptize the holy ghost in fire and fire, that was a saying of Zeno, and everyone listening knew what it meant. Well, when Paul says, Christ sent me not to baptize, I've got, I've got a baptism of my own. Why would God say, go in the world and baptize in water? He wouldn't say that. Not possible. He would say, go baptize with my baptism. So when you get to Paul, look over here in Philippians. Look in Philippians. I don't have time to reset the whole thing for the Pharisees who, who had set up, they had set up, the Pharisees had set up a proselyte process, proselyte process. And they said, in order to become a member of Israel or the kingdom of God, you had to do three things. You had to be circumcised, washed in water that they called a new birth. That was the water baptism. That's where it comes from. Water baptism. And you had to offer two turtle doves. Well, Jesus' mother had offered two turtle doves when she had him circumcised. The only thing she hadn't done was washed him in water. So anytime you have to go through that, that's why he was that's why he was washed. That's why he was washed by John the Baptist. That was a proselyte baptism. The Pharisees kept calling Jesus a Samaritan. That was northern Israel, and the Pharisees hated northern Israel. I can't spell what I'm writing. Say M A R I T M A R I T A N. That was northern Israel, and the Pharisees hated northern Israel. They wouldn't step foot in there. They said it was unclean. They said he was Samaritan because he was from, he was from the land of Zebulun or Nazareth. That's why they said, can anything good, clean come out of Nazareth? Saying Nazareth is the same thing as saying a septic tank. Jesus of Nazareth wasn't a commendable title in that first century. So they said they wouldn't have nothing to do with it. So he, if he would be washed in water by their Pharisee law, they had to listen to him. Well, did he? We know that he was a Pharisee. He says that here in Philippians. And the Pharisees practiced 
all these halakha laws. This was called the halakha. It was a verbal law. That was an addition. Water baptism is an addition to the Word of God. It was blotted out. It's no longer a part of the Word of God. And then he says here, he's giving his qualifications. He says, though I'm, look at verse 4 of chapter 3 of Philippians. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he hath, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. As touching the law, I was a Pharisee, and I believed in the verbal law, and this was a part of the verbal law. Verbal law. What does he think about the verbal law, the halakha? Look over here in Galatians. First chapter of Galatians. Galatians. First chapter. He says here, this will spell it out for you. Galatians 1. In verse 13, for you have heard of my conversation, my parad- my anastrophe, my way of living in time past in Jewish religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God. I killed them and I wasted it. That means to murder and profited in the Jews religion, in the Jews verbal law above many mine equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions, the paradosis, the verbal law. That's why we know he was washing people in water. That's why he said, I'm thankful that I didn't baptize any more than I washed in water. I'm thankful I didn't do any more than I did because I got a bunch of people confused. Now go back. So if he's, if he's just really intent on the Jewish law before God strikes him down on the, on the road to Damascus, he was a believer in the... He said he's a believer in the paradosis. He said it right there in Galatians. When you look up tradition, it'll say traditionary law of Moses. That's not the law. That's not the law of God. Then what he says, go back to here and look here at 1 Corinthians. Back to this. He says, look at verse 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Christmas and Gaius, lest I should say that I baptized in my own name. I baptized also. He's talking about water. Some of the household of Stephanus, besides, I know not whether I washed in water any other. For Christ sent me not to wash in water, but to preach the gospel. What's the beginning of the gospel? If you look in Luke, go to Luke. This is what God called him to do. Luke 3. This is what he called him to do and he called the apostles to do and he calls every one of us to do the same thing he called Paul to do. Look at Luke the third chapter. I've said this before. The gospel is the blood baptism. That's what Luke says here. I've connected these a few years ago. And I hope people can get a hold of this. Luke 3, verse, speaking of John the Baptist, verse 3, he came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance, which is a blood baptism for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah. So the blood baptism is written in Isaiah. Blood 
baptism equals, this is what does Isaiah say it equals. As it's written in the book of Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way. That's the blood baptism that Paul said God sent him to do. Prepare ye the way. Hodos. Narrow is the way. When you preach narrow is the way, you're preaching the blood baptism. You're actually preaching the gospel because Mark 1, 1 through 3 says, the beginning of the gospel is, as it was written in the prophets, prepare ye the way. So the gospel equals the blood baptism. Gospel equals blood baptism. That's what God sent Paul and the apostles and you and I to preach. The narrow way. There's two ways, a narrow way and a broad way. The narrow way is the blood baptism. It equals the blood baptism. I hope you can see that because that was a miracle to me when I saw it. There is a broad way that leads to destruction and many are going into the broad way. And the blood baptism, a blood baptism was a death. It doesn't mean to pour blood on somebody. It was an idiom. It meant to undergo a death. That's death to self daily when you tell people the truth. How do you die daily? By telling them this truth. Prepare you the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And then that's the same thing that Mark, the first chapter, says. So when Paul said, Christ sent me not to wash people in water, but to preach the gospel, which is the blood baptism, which is death to self. You cannot be a Christian without a daily cross dying to the flesh. Jesus said so in Luke 14, 27. He that beareth not his cross and followeth after me cannot be my disciple. You can't be a follower of Christ and be a learner and give up yourself without a daily cross. That is the gospel. I've been, I've, I hear these preachers talking about, we've got to preach the gospel. Well, what is it? Well, it's good news, and that's it. The good news is that you have to be in the narrow way. Narrow is the word thalibo, T-H-T-H-L-I-B-O. It is a form. It is a form of the word thalipsis, T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S. And that is the word tribulation. The blood baptism is going through tribulation. For doing what? We're teaching people truth and saying Christmas is pagan, Easter is pagan. God does not love everybody. That'll put you in a blood baptism every time. But you know why people don't like that? Their mind is on earthly things. That's what Philippians, the third chapter, if you read on down in that same chapter we were in, Paul said, they're enemies of the cross of Christ there at Philippi. He didn't mean they were vessels of wrath. He said they're in the church and their God is their belly. The belly was the seat of all sensual desires. Seat of sensual desires. And that was an Epicurean term. Belly. Paul used that several times. The God is their belly and their mind of the believer is on earthly. G-E. Phroneo. P-H-R-O-N-E-O -E is the word mind. This is one of my favorite verses to tell to believers about because I believe there's a lot of Believers that hate that daily cross, they don't want their friends crucifying them. My family, I don't, I don't want them crucifying me. Earthly is the word gay. It means soil or dirt. They like dirt. You know what's dirt? You, me, this building, your car, everything you see that's material, 
is dirt. It came out of the ground. New York City was here a million years ago. It was just in the ground. All it needed to be was refined. Everything was in the ground that we can see. Everything. Every person you see, you go to your job, you work in a building that's made out of dirt. You're made out of dirt. Your boss is made out of dirt. You're doing that to gain the world. You have to have a responsibility enough to make a living to feed your family and pay the rent, but you don't have to overextend yourself and try to get rich by schemes, which the world does, so you can have all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and distribute fortunes and become a demon. And you become a demon. That's just the outer man. Notice how all this stuff goes, just clicks together. I I don't understand why I can find, how can I find Mark 1, 1 and 2 and Luke 13, 3 and the baptism is prepare you the way and and the gospel is prepare you the way and they were equal to the same thing. So the gospel is the blood baptism. That's what it is. And that's tribulation. I, I just, I don't understand why I can find these verses and these preachers can't find any of them. If you find out that the gospel is the blood baptism, you have to eliminate water. It has to go. And I just, the way I do this, I think of it analytically. I analyze everything when I'm studying. I've noticed that all these things, I got to the garden, I found the beast, the sword, the famine, the pestilence. I found the demon. I found distributing fortunes and it was the mark of the beast was where God forbid them to go beyond the boundary line and partake of the... The mark of the beast is already in the minds of the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And we have got a portion of that on our outer man. And God's got to eliminate that outer man so we can be have our minds on him and not on dirt. Dirt is our big problem. When you like that woman that you can't have, you like the dirt that she's in. She's got a shapely dirt and you like it. And that's tough. You can't just have what you want. If you think you can, go ahead. If you belong to God, He won't let you do that. It'll beat the tired of you. Said He would. I've got so much more on this. I'm going to keep on talking about what we've added to the Word of God. They've added water baptism to the Word of God, and it's just not true. They had it in the Old Testament, but it was a picture of that which is to come. It was a shadow, a skia. You can't. You can't add anything to the Word of God or subtract anything from it. Boy, has the world really subtracted predestination from the Word. They sure have. Had people write to me and tell me I'm crazy and going to hell because I preach predestination. No, you're going to hell if you don't believe it. I do not believe you can hate predestination and go to heaven when you die. You cannot hate any part of the Word of God and go to heaven. You may be confused by it, but don't say you hate it. Don't say you're going to hell because you preach it because you may be a candidate for hell yourself. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Sometimes I don't know how to get all these things out that you've let me see. I pray that you'll fight our battles. we got a lot of people who want to destroy us. These people that write to us and say these terrible things, Lord, you be the judge concerning their their eternal soul. I won't do that. We pray that you'll give us strength, courage to continue in this work we're doing, strengthen the flock. We know there's a lot of people out there that are believers that are watching us on the Internet right now. Give them strength to keep on keeping on. We'll praise you for everything in Christ's name. Amen.
feel like I'm just skimming a rock over the top of the water. Don't feel like I'm doing what I need to do. I like the shape of that dirt. <laughs> <laughs> So it's man's imagination waxing worse and worse and worse. Well, it is. Man's getting crazy. I really believe the people are crazy in the world. I believe most of the world's crazy. They're not crazy like the people at Central State. They're just imagining everything. Hey, you don't want to know you're funny? Come on, let's go. Oh, no.